John is going to be our speaker, and, and uh, robotic process automation, as we know, by itself enables automation of only slices of repetitive, redundant, structured transactions. HCL's Dry Ice COPA, remember the thing about the acronyms, Cognitive Orchestrated Process Autonomics, combines RPA, AI, NL, oops, ML, and NLP, more of those acronyms, so we know this thing's real. Uh, Jagan is responsible for HCL's global solutions, and he's practice leader for dry ice, uh, COPA. He's been involved in a number of technology programs over his career, lots of exciting transactions that have led to um, over $100 million of revenue in, in big engagements. And so I think we have a spectacular speaker to give us a perspective on another of the amazing tools that's out there in this disruptive space, and that is HCL's Dry Ice COPA. Please join me in welcoming Jagan. Thanks, Craig. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start um, um, about dry ice and our solution, as such a quick snapshot of HCL, we are a $7 billion enterprise, uh, roughly 80% of it coming from engineering services and IT you know, uh, operations as such, right? Um, engineering, we pretty much you know, handle uh, um, um, engineering design and the software engineering part of it for uh, everyone from the largest aviation and uh, engineering company to you know, the largest networking products company. Um, so that's a big chunk of what we do. And then IT operations from applications to IT infrastructure management, that's the other big chunk of what we do. About 120,000 idea pronouns, as we call um, them, you know, strong. And within dry ice, you know, which is our core autonomics platform, um, it's, it's a mix of about 50 microservices built with AI, machine learning, natural language processing, and RPA or runbook automation, which is pretty much modular, and I'll take you through that. Uh, we are about 300 odd, uh, you know, data scientists to ML engineers to developers and you know architects. So that's the context about HCL and uh, dry ice as such. Um, like Chip mentioned, you know, I'm going to take you through. You know, we have, uh, you know, um, we have done enough of uh, robotic process automation, run book automation. We are a big fan of, uh, you know, moving up from where we were in terms of Unix scripts you know, on the ID side to you know, VB scripts or Excel macros. Um, we have come a long way in terms of uh, you know, moving up from those to RPA, um, which uh, you know, essentially allows us to um, uh, incrementally you know, um, multiply the you know, uh, business case impacts we have seen. Right? We have done close to 100 plus processes uh, you know, in terms of automation for 12 different clients. Um, and delivered pretty good, uh, you know, um, ROI, right? I mean, um, um, you know, um, 500, 600 plus, uh, you know, in large scale operations that we have automated, right? But there have also been, you know, um, implementations where probably, you know, we didn't see the kind of, you know, um, ROI impact that probably, you know, we would have typically expected from what would be a, you know, disruptive, you know, um, technology implementation as such, right? Um, but even in those cases, we always had other factors playing in, right? You know, um, I think right through today, we have seen several factors being, you know, uh, the driver for RPA, customer experience to, you know, um, um, risk mitigation to capacity management. One of our logistics clients, a large global logistics player, was hit really, really badly, you know, with the WannaCry vi virus, you know, um, a couple of months back to the extent that they had to shut down their entire IT ecosystem for a couple of weeks, right? They just, from individual laptops to their servers and uh, databases, everything had to be brought down. For two weeks, um, a little more than two weeks actually, all their entire operation went back probably, you know, 30, 40 years, right? I mean, everything was handwritten. Consignment notes were handwritten. So when the systems came back up, you know, obviously most of it had to be replaced, literally, right? Um, there was a huge surge of transactions that had to be, you know, digitized and then, you know, executed, right? Um, that's one classic scenario where we implemented and adapted, uh, you know, RPA, you know, to quickly, you know, get it back on track. Not so much for ROI, but, you know, um, obviously, you know, um, had a huge impact in terms of business getting back to normal, right? Um, so we have done enough of, you know, large banking, you know, um, processes where we have seen 
500, 600 percentage ROIs to, you know, strategic ones where probably ROI was not the critical one, but there were other, other business drivers, right? But we also knew that, you know, um, RPA by design is constrained, right? Um, I think at least in a couple of sessions today, you know, we saw um, explicit criteria being called out on what to look for when you qualify something for RPA, right? Repetitive activities, transactional ones, you know, rules driven, structured data. Essentially, while it's great in terms of how do we quickly, you know, achieve what we want to, it also implies that, you know, we are boxing it in, right? You know, there are these bunch of criteria, eight rules that we will have to put everything in and on, if and only if something, you know, meets those criteria can we really, you know, get RPA into and, you know, see the business impact that we want, right? So what does that do? You know, the moment we say repetitive tasks, the moment we say it has to be rule-based, what it essentially does is when you take an end-to-end -end workflow, you know, be it um, a banking, uh, you know, process or an IT, you know, operation um, uh, process, it essentially makes us break it into silos, right? Look for small components in an end-to-end -end workflow that can be, you know, tr uh, transactional, rule-based and, you know, be automated, right? When we break that into silos, what happens is, from a user perspective, it obviously you know gives a you know fragmented experience, right? Um, someone who wants to open a you know um, a bank account or a, you know a mortgage, you know uh, wants to take a mortgage, uh, you know um, we have a bot that can actually talk to a, you know prospective customer, tell them what mortgage product or her what mortgage products are available with the you know firm that they can opt for. But then immediately says, you know, you're going to have a submit a bunch of documents, you know, the title docs to everything, and therefore I'm going to have to, uh, you know, have a rep call you, right? So one, you know, there's a handover. The rep then takes all the documentation, submits it to someone else for processing, which probably could be done by RPA, but then there are always clarifications, validations. It again gets handed back to someone else who, you know, then owns that exception and then reaches out to the customer. So in that whole process, if you look at it, while we have automated parts of it and with pretty good you know ROI and you know business impact you know there if you look at the end-to-end -end process and the value chain you know one it's we have made it fragmented you know the customer has multiple touch points in most cases and third if you look at the end-to-end -end value chain you know not so much in terms of you know um, ROI impact as such right um, I was talking to one of the CFOs, uh, you know, I know, you know, we spoke about ROI, where does it come from, you know, um, um, I was talking to one of the CFOs, uh, you know, of a large consumer organization, um, we're trying to get into, you know, automation in a big way, and, and, and his view was, you know, um, and, and that was one of the, you know, uh, uh, trigger points that we also, you know, worked in terms of uh, getting this whole COPA solution in place. His view was, you know, we have seen this and heard this several times, right? I was told that, you know, move, move to a good ERP, you know, um, strong ERP, your operations are going to become so much seamless, there's going to be so much ROI, there's going to be, you know, so much, uh, you know, uh, improved, uh, you know, compliance. We went through that, we were told we have to add a couple of more modules, add a sales force from a sales perspective or add a, you know, BPM, you know, for the specific operation. And then we were told, uh, you know, um, everything needs to be moved to cloud if you really want to see the ROI that you, you know, expected five years down the line when, you know, or ten years down the line when you started this journey, right? So they w we went through all of that. And then one fine day you come in and tell me, now that great, you have put everything digital, you have put everything on cloud, do you know that someone can hack into and take everything in a minute? Holy cow, you asked me for the last ten years to move everything from one place to the other place to digitize, to invest and, you know, um, get it here and then tell me everything can be gone in a day, right, or a minute, right, you know, when someone hacks into. So what do I need to do now? Again, put in endpoint security, put in, you know, perimeter security, you know, all of it and invest on it. So his view was, when am I really going to see the dollars, right? I have been told for the last couple of decades, if not at least a decade, right, I mean, that do this and you're going to see great returns, right? Do that, you're going to see great, see great returns, right? I mean, and, and it is kind of Ill elusive, right? I mean, probably there have been incremental benefits with each of these things that have been done, but is it really what, you know, was sold into a CEO or a CFO? Probably not, right? And I think morning, uh, you know, Sarah spoke to us about, uh, um, you know, the systems landscape being an important part of, you know, um, uh, how much RPA can, you know, um, deliver in terms of benefits. And I think if, if I remember right, I mean, some organization 
that had close to 2,800, you know, systems, right? I mean, individual systems and applications. If you think of it, someone has gone and sold the, you know, organization on each of these 2,800 systems, saying this is going to change your ROI, you know, uh, and, and operations, you know, significantly, right? So, you know, there is an organization that has actually, you know, at different stages, probably some of it could have come in from acquisitions and integrations, but someone has, you know, really expected that I'm going to get a huge impact and an ROI benefit if I do this, and, you know, that's happened, you know, some 500, 600 times with each application that has been added on, right? Um, so, the point is, you know, we are all at a stage, you know, as, uh, you know, at a CXO, you know, um, uh, level, we are at a stage where there is, you know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tired feeling setting in, right? We have gone through this journey of making investment, we are making investment, making investment, and we have only added on, you know, complexity. The risk factor has not gone down, right? I mean, 20 years back when everything was, you know, starting to be digitized and, um, you know, um, ERPs came in and everything was adapted, the uh, same perceptions were there. Customer experience is going to go up, you know, risk is going to be significantly down, but it does not, right? What, you ask any CEO, CTO, even today, what keeps them up in the night, it's going to be, you know, information security, right, R and compliance, right? So, you know, um, that's, that's just the fact of life. So w what we did is, you know, essentially said, okay, we will go back, right? I mean, um, what the message was loud and clear that, you know, don't, don't give us incremental benefits, right? I don't want to automate a part of the transaction, right? I mean, we need to look at the bigger picture, right? Um, and that's what we wanted to do as well. We wanted to see how do we expand automation beyond those transactional, you know, silos, right? So that, you know, we can, you know, and how do we address the CFO, CFO's, uh, you know, and the CFO's challenge in terms of when am I really going to see the hard dollars, you know, um, coming back to me, right? At that moment, my answer was, you know, well, good luck, right? I mean, you know, that's what we go through in personal life as well, right? I mean, when I started my career, I thought, you know, um, as I move up and, you know, start earning more, my bank balance would much look, uh, you know, uh, much, much uh, better, right, at the end of the month. I mean, probably a marriage and a kid later and even today, you know, my bank balance looks the same way at the end of each month, right? I mean, that's just what we go through and, you know, we just have to live with it, right? I mean, uh, um, so uh, while, while we say that, obviously, you know, we didn't stop at that, right? I mean, you know, um, we went back to the drawing table, we looked at, you know, how do we really, um, you know, address these challenges and prepare ourselves really, right? I mean, for what is going to be the next wave of automation, right? The first wave of automation, obviously, we saw the, you know, um, macros and the, you know, scripts take us through, you know, um, that part of it. The second wave really, you know, um, um, is evolving and evolving at a much faster pace in terms of, uh, you know, um, RPA and runbook automation probably is in a lot more mature phase, but uh, robotic process automation is evolving, right, I mean, um, in terms of adoption. But we really wanted to come up with something that will, you know, help us change the, you know, game, right, and that's, that's what really, you know, COPA or Cognitive Orchestrated Process Autonomics is about. While we went back to the drawing board, we looked, looked at, you know, where is our, you know, um, inspiration, right? Um, we know that we love to, you know, um, get things, you know, um, done end-to-end, -end, you know, in terms of automation and in that process improve the experience of the users. And, and to me, you know, the best, uh, you know, analogy I could think of was wanted to do, I wanted to do something like what a motherboard inside our, you know, um, our smartphone or, you know, our computer does, right? There is the whole power management aspect, there is the whole processing component, there is, you know, memory and storage there, you know, there is a whole host of components that come together for me really to get the, you know, end benefit in terms of computational, you know, power that I need, right? Or, you know, when I had to send this presentation out, I mean, today I know that I have to be here and I have to, you know, show you a presentation and take you through what COPA is. I didn't bother about, you know, um, what uh, operating system, you know, uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, Sean going to be, you know, um, uh, putting this on, put, putting my presentation on, or, you know, what underlying processor does that uh, laptop, you know, that uh, on which he's running it, you know, um, uh, really, you know, use so that I can be prepared for it. I didn't have to bother about any of that. I just had to send the, you know, presentation to Amanda and Sean. Sean trusted a Dell or a HP laptop to take care of everything the moment he puts that in. And there's a whole bunch of components, thousands of components inside the motherboard that all work 
seamlessly to make sure that you are able to see the presentation that I you know um, uh, sent out to Sean, right? And when I click this button, hopefully, <laughs> so you know there are thousands of components again coming together on his laptop to make sure that the slide moves to the next one, right? I don't care about what is running inside. I don't care about you know um, how much uh, you know processing capacity it has, what all technologies it brings together. At the end of the day. I need to put in a file there and I need to be able to process it, right? That's all I need. And that's where enterprises are going to, right? I mean, if I really, you know, um, strip out, you know, what the CFO, you know, um, told me, you know, last month, that's what it really boils down to, right? I mean, at the end of the day, enterprises should be looking for automating, orchestrating, improving user experience, reducing, you know, cost, right? They shouldn't be worried about, you know, um, I, I, I did hear a lot of questions about, you know, what platforms, how do we choose? And I, and, and I you know, I remember Chip saying, you know, um, or Mark saying, you know, don't try this at home, right? I mean, there are experts, and that's really what we want to be, right? We want to hear what, you know, um, uh, the requirement is and come up with the solution, implement it, and deliver the, you know, uh, user experience improvement, the cost reduction. And, and to do that, we had to obviously, you know, draw a parlance to, you know, um, how an enterprise works, right? So if you look at an enterprise, again, you know, um, similarly, you know, there are providers. It could be the CFO, you know, who has to run the, you know, um, uh, finance operations. It could be the, you know, chief people officer or a HR officer who has to run the HR operations. It could be the CTO who has to run a service desk, make sure that the systems are available. So there are a bunch of providers. And then there are there are a bunch of consumers, right? The consumers could be employees, you know, consuming a HR, you know, um, process being, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, provided by the HR chief HR officer, or a, you know, um, uh, an, an employee, you know, who wants to procure something through the you know procurement office, or just wants an you know um, invoice paid, you know, um, for something that's already bought. So there are a bunch of you know um, consumers or it could be an external uh, you know customer or a vendor as well right so there are a bunch of providers and there are a bu bunch of you know consumers and then there is a whole host of processes you know um, and systems you know that connect the two right it could be the erp it could be the crm it could be you know um, multiple databases powering those employee database to you know vendor database to you know the accounting database um, so there's there's a bunch of systems there could be the procure to pay, order to cash, record to report, you know, payroll processing, or uh, you know, um, data center management, you know, network management, multiple processes and multiple systems. At the end of the day, the reality is all of these come together in an enterprise, and we know exactly, you know, um, 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 uh, what the landscape is. What we did is, you know, um, when I said about 50 microservices, uh, what we did is went back to the drawing table and built individual components that will help us automate and orchestrate you know, each of these, right? And we deliberately kept it modular so that we can plug and play the right technology for the right use case, right? If we need artificial intelligence, today you know, um, we have a bunch of data scientists, you know, a bunch of uh, you know, um, AI engineers working together along with the best of professors from Carnegie Mellon and Stanford building our own proprietary algorithms um, machine learning algorithms, natural language processing. So we have built a bunch of you know um, algorithms for, for specific needs, and we have also leveraged what is available in the market. And then you know we have partnerships with uh, pretty much you know all leading robotic process automation or runbook automation platforms, so Blue Prism to you know Automation Anywhere to WorkFusion. So um, um, and we have built our own cognitive virtual agent called uh, Lucy. Um, you know, which is essentially, you know, um, and I know we are going to see Amelia, you know, um, uh, later, but it's essentially a, you know, um, virtual assistant that can do the communication and the collaboration, be it with end customers or with employees. It could do the front end communication and collaboration. We have the robotic process automation and the runbook automation to do the back end automation, and then we have a whole bunch of algorithms and, you know, um, 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 uh, tool sets that we have built around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. What we promise is that we will look at the requirement, we will look at what needs to be transformed and automated, and we will bring in the right platform, the technology, to make sure that, one, we are able to take the throughput up to close to 90%, right? I mean, uh, in most cases, and in some cases, even beyond that, right? So one, um, the traditional RPA that we did, one of the learnings, key learnings that we had was 
like I think we have seen right through the day. Typically, we see about you know um, um, 60 to you know 70 percent in terms of automation throughput, but because of the um, you know um, um, uh, because of the silos that sit outside of that automation uh, you know environment. Um, the real cost benefit translation actually gets halved, right? So in terms of the FTE gain or you know the cost takeout, that tends to be pretty much diluted. And and one of our key you know um, uh, observations was that we really have to take the automation throughput close to 90%, if not more, for us to really see that incremental benefit in the cost takeout, which will justify you know and uh, uh, increase the ROI, right? So and that's essentially what we have done. You know um, we are working with a couple of clients where we are already seen in the first few projects that we had uh, done, you know uh, upwards of 90% you know automation. At the same time not necessarily bringing in a whole sword when we can actually just do it with a needle right so the reason uh, the other reason why we made everything modular is so that we really don't have to you know leverage artificial intelligence or machine learning or a particular platform or a tool if we don't need to right while i i, I told about you know the cfo who was asking me about when am i going to see the dollar I've also seen the other end of it, right? I mean, last week I was uh, meeting another client, you know, who was very happy, excited, said, I have the budget approved to use artificial intelligence and do something this year, right? I said, I mean, we can't start off saying, I will use artificial intelligence to do something, right? We want to look at what the use case is, where can we really, you know, automate, and in that process, if we need to use artificial intelligence, we will use it. But, but we won't start off saying, I have the budget approved and therefore, you know, I have to use artificial intelligence somewhere or the other, right? So I think we have tried to keep a balance of it. We will use the right level of technology. We will use the right level of, uh, you know, um, um, platforms that are needed, but we will not overdo it. And that's, that's one of the other reasons why we have kept all of this modular. So that's COPA essentially takes you know um, automation orchestration to enable 90% plus automation throughput and in that process provide a seamless experience to the users or the consumers. So I told you about you know um, what the platform is. Uh, you know um, there are three you know um, um, uh, you know central you know solutions um, in COPA. The first is, uh, you know, um, the robotic process automation or the runbook automation platform itself. Um, and obviously, we have partnerships, uh, you know, with all leading players. Um, our effort has not been to reinvent the wheel, but to leverage what is pretty much available, you know, um, uh, and make use of it. So you look at, uh, you know, WorkFusion to Blue Prism to Automation Anywhere to, um, you know, even UiPath and uh, Pega. You know, we pretty much leverage the uh, platforms, uh, and we will, you know, um, either pick the right one based on the necessity, or if the client has already made an investment into one platform, we will just plug it, plug our solution into that. Right. The second component is iAutomate, which is our proprietary, you know, module, um, and that's essentially the, you know, um, cognitive decision making and the knowledge management, you know, engine. Right. Uh, we spoke about crowdsourcing, uh, you know, in the morning, you know. Um, and, and th we started this primarily, you know, um, from our IT operations automation. We managed close to a million plus networking devices, um, two and a half million plus, you know, end user computing devices, uh, petabytes of, uh, you know, um, storage and data. So there's a wealth of information that we already had. And one challenge we, you know, um, had was while we automated using runbook automation, the fact of the life is that, I mean, you know, the technology landscape keeps changing. There is always a patch. I think there was some question in the morning about, you know, um, how do we handle the situation when there are frequent patches coming in, updates coming in. And that's, that's you know, um, that's, that, that was a challenge for us at, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, IT operations automation as well, right? So what we uh, did is, you know, brought together, you know, deep learning, um, uh, brought together, you know, um, um, some of our proprietary algorithms around it. And build the ability to understand, you know, the context. Learn, you know, um, not just from our own subject matter experts, uh, you know, who sit across multiple client operations, but also be able to go out to the web, go out to the actual technology providers, find out the solution to a new, you know, um, scenario that comes up, and then learn from it and add it on to its repository. Right. So um, um, that's I automate. It also allows us to automate uh, decision making wherever judgmental decision making is involved. Again, it brings in deep learning and you know um, um, uh, our own algorithms to be able to automate those decisions. 
And the last component is, uh, uh, you know, Lucy, which is our uh, cognitive virtual agent. Again, built in partnership with uh, IBM Watson. Um, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, leverages Google, uh, uh, you know, um, text-to-speech and um, uh, speech-to-text engines um, integrated with Amazon. So again, you know, a cognitive virtual agent, not you know, um, uh, proprietary in a sense. You know, um, it's fully you know dependent on our solutions. But we have taken the best of what's available in the industry and built on top of it, right? So um, three key solutions that uh, together, uh, you know, form Copa, um, RPA, RBA, iAutomate, Lucy. And like you can see, you know, it's pretty much powered by the best in the industry. We have restricted what we want to build ourselves to where we saw a gap in the marketplace, right? Other than that, we have pretty much leveraged IBM or ServiceNow or SnapLogic, you know, in terms of integrations um, uh, and all, uh, you know, RPA, RBA platforms. What does, what does all this mean? Um, like I said, every single process. When we went back to the drawing board, you know, and, and started looking at it, you know, um, uh, you know, a holistic way, uh, the, uh, you know, um, what we did is we realized that every single process, whether it is IT or you know, business, originates with a front office. There is always a back office component. In an IT scenario, it could be the IT service desk, which is the front office, takes the issues, you know, or the service requests. It could be a you know banking, you know, um, customer care or a, you know um, front, uh, you know, front office operation for a banking, you know, client. But there's always a front office component, which is characterized by natural language processing. Invariably, in most cases, you know, um, it's characterized by unstructured data. Um, and, and that's where we bring in our Lucy virtual agent and our AI and ML engines. And then there is always a back office component, right? In the IT scenario, it could be, you know, um, a remediation of a particular incident, you know, could be a network incident, could be a, you know, server incident. But there is always a back office team that does the actual, you know, transactional execution. Um, it could, in a, in a typical business environment, it could be, you know, the actual back office that processes the invoices, for instance. Uh, so there's always a back office component which is characterized by the um, transactional nature of activities, you know, the rule-based decision making, if at all, and in most cases, the data is patterned or, uh, you know, digital, right? So, and, and there we obviously leverage our uh, robotic process automation, runbook automation, and scripts. Um, and then there is always a middle office component, which is where the decision making comes in, right? In an IT scenario, it could be, you know, a particular in incident needing actually a change to be implemented or taking a particular, you know, application down for some time to fix that. And, and there is a decision making in terms of what time is it best to, you know, take the application down? When is it going to be least impactful on the organization? So there is always a middle office component that needs judgmental decision making. Um, it's cognitive in nature, and that's where we bring in our iAutomate, you know, um, intelligent automation solution and uh, the uh, algorithms that we have built, right? So, net net, um, Copa, in one view, is uh, essentially your one-stop automation orchestration solution that addresses front office, middle office, back office components all together, and which is how we really get to that 90% plus automation throughput, right? Because we don't stop at just back office op uh, uh, part of a particular process. We take the front office, middle office, back office, and look at automation altogether, right? There could be some 5%, 10%, which will still need that, you know, make a checker, you know, balancing or, you know, um, um, uh, you know the um, exception management part of it. But in most cases, we get to, you know, 90% plus automation throughput. What, what does all that mean? You know, obviously, you know, um, one, you know, our automations are, uh, you know, dynamic, you know, as the business and the process change because we don't restrict it to, you know, one place and we don't, you know, um, shy away from uh, deep integrations. Uh, you know, uh, we can pretty much, uh, you know, um, adapt it um, because of, uh, you know, um, taking the front office, middle office, back office components together. Um, our throughputs are much higher, like I said, you know, close to 90%. And what that means is less handovers from a user perspective, therefore better, you know, user experience. And from a, you know, um, a CXO perspective, it's a higher ROI, right? When we automate 90% of a transaction, it allows us to free up a lot more in terms of FTE capacity than when we just get to, you know, 50 or 60 percentage, right? It might, you know, look um, like we have moved it from 60 percent automation throughput to 90 percent automation throughput, but in terms of the actual FTE capacity freeing up, that makes a huge difference, right? I mean, when we are looking at 50 to 60 percent, because of the cyclical nature of, you know, the uh, volume, you know, coming in or the, you know, um, 
um, uh, the uh, need for you know um, backup availability the FTE throughput gets much reduced but when you get close to 90 percent you just need to factor in for that balance 5 10 percent exception management right so it in increases the FTE capacity you know um, uh, release much much uh, you know uh, better so that's essentially COPA um, what I'm going to take you through now is uh, you know um, a quick demo of uh, you know um, what we did for one of the largest uh, track the world, makers uh, globally. By its very nature of constant change and evolution, has thrown various challenges for enterprises to meet and overcome. More and more enterprises are leveraging the power of AI to meet those challenges by bridging the gap between escalating expectations and ground realities to help them to be bigger, better, faster and more agile than ever before and to overcome our natural limitations. One such implementation is that of Cognitive Orchestrated Process Autonomics or COPA. COPA is the seamless integration of cognitive technologies, advanced analytics and process automation across the front, middle and back office respectively to create a unified experience to end users. To demonstrate, let us take a look at a use. Oops, sorry. Is it going to start all over again? The world, by its very nature of constant change and evolution, Marketing has thrown various wants. challenges <laughs> you know, for enterprises to meet visuals, and overcome. Right? I mean, so let me just get. More and more enterprises are leveraging the power of AI to meet those challenges by bridging the gap between escalating expectations and ground realities, to help them to be bigger, better, faster, and more agile than ever before, and to overcome our natural limitations. One such implementation is that of Cognitive Orchestrated Process Autonomics, or COPA. COPA is the seamless integration of cognitive technologies, advanced analytics and process automation across the front, middle, and back office respectively, to create a unified experience to end users. To demonstrate, let us... Okay, so just for context, you know, um, what we are going to see is um, the solution that we, you know, built for one of the largest, uh, you know, um, global truck players. The way uh, you know our engagement and discussions with them really started about you know bringing together Lucy, which is our cognitive virtual agent, along with you know the backend automation, to automate their end-to-end -end application support you know um, um, function. Right. So they had dealers in 40 countries and using you know 14 different applications, and obviously you know applications need break fix, and you know they needed uh, they they run a you know application support help desk purely for. Um, you know um, the dealers, uh, and they wanted to leverage Lucy and automation to you know um, uh, make it virtual, and which is what we you know um, got into. But while we had the discussion and the initial design done, um, the CEO of the you know unit came to us requesting you know um, can we look at the other aspect of what the, you know cha their his real challenge was. His view was and you know um, yes, I mean there are issues with the applications. We are right now you know trying to fix it manually. But it would be great if we could make it virtual. But his view was, you know, I ha while the issue gets resolved, and obviously depending upon whether it's, uh, you know, um, a simple break fix or, you know, a complex one which is not uh, going to need, uh, you know, third party, you know, um, collaboration, it takes anywhere between, you know, um, half an hour to, you know, a few days, right, to resolve. But while that happens, um, there is a customer sitting with a dealer wanting to place an order for a truck, and these are high value trucks. And the customer, you know, is not able to do that because the systems are not available. And unlike a, you know, consumer, you know, um, product, there is a lot of customization that goes into these trucks. The, the availability of parts and the variations, you know, change significantly. The cost changes significantly depending upon what customization and configuration the customer wants. And therefore, without the actual, you know, um, um, ability to see each of those the order you know um, really cannot go through right so the ceo's pain point was yes you know um, it will be great if my dealers can have an improved experience in terms of fixing up issues with the you know uh, applications they use 
but I want to improve the customer experience. I want to make sure you know I don't lose an order, right? So what we did is brought together Lucy obviously to be the front end which talks to the you know um, dealer, um, and in this case you know they pretty much choose uh, uh, chose a uh, you know um, web based uh, you know interface which sits inside our dealer portal, um, and from within the dealer portal, the moment they need a support, you know they um, trigger Lucy, and you know have a conversation to resolve you know um, whatever the technical issues. But also, you know, um, what you're going to see now is how we bring together Lucy and automation to actually make sure while, you know, the dealer is not able to place, take the order directly, um, how we, you know, do it from the back end with uh, Lucy and automation, right? So that's the context. Um, I'll let you watch the rest of the video. Let's take a look at a use case of interaction between intelligent Lucy, which is a cognitive assistant, and the business user and how the integration of Lucy with different systems provides for a seamless transition. Thank you for choosing to chat with us. Welcome to the Sales Web Chat. My name is Lucy. How can I help you, Mr. Mike? Hi, Lucy. I'd like to order some trucks. Lucy is powered by NLP and is capable of understanding the context of the request, even if it is grammatically incorrect. The user can either type in his request or can use voice input to converse with Lucy. For example, he could type order trucks and Lucy can still understand the context and map it to the current intent. Sure, I'll look into this for you. Could you please confirm if it's a new order or an existing order? New order. Can you please tell me how many trucks you would like to order? Three. Sure. I'll be glad to assist you on your order, and could you please provide your contact number? Thank you. Could you now please select the truck model you'd like to purchase? Lucy uses machine learning and its integration with enterprise systems to bring out the right information to the user. Would you like to customize your trucks? Yes, thanks for asking. From the choices below, what would be preferred choice of color for your trucks? Let me choose black. Good choice. And would you like all your trucks in the same color choice? Yes. Wonderful. We have your choice of color. And what would be your preference on exterior specifications? Let me choose high variant. Great. Would you like all your trucks in the same choice of design? Yes. Brilliant. We have your choice of exterior specifications. And what would be your preference on internal design? I'll go with sleeper cap. Okay. And would you like to explore a few accessories for your trucks? I'd like to have a fire extinguisher with this. I am sending over your request for placing an order. Please wait. Okay. So that was the front-end interface or the you know, communication between the dealer and uh, Lucy. Now, with all the details that Lucy took, and obviously, you know, they're real time, so the moment Volvo, you know, has a part not being available, you wouldn't see that option, you know, uh, being given to the dealer, or if there is a new model or a new option available, that would automatically, you know, come in and be available for Lucy. In this case, like I said, we, you know, the uh, customer chose to, you know, uh, use the web interface, but you, we also have Lucy integrated with Facebook Messenger. For instance, um, we are talking to one of the largest consumer product players in terms of integrating Lucy to manage some of their campaign responses, right? So all the customers have to do is go to Facebook Messenger, ping Lucy, and ask for whatever they want or even place an order for some product that they want, right? So we could do that uh, with Facebook Messenger. It's integrated with Alexa, like you know, like I said. So you know, um, a customer can be you know um, um, in the gym or you know um, cooking dinner and still be able to you know um, call Lucy through Alexa and get whatever you know they need to be uh, you know um, uh, get done, right? So. Um, it's also from an enterprise perspective integrated with both Skype for business on-prem and cloud, right? So if it's a business, uh, you know, um, scenario, um, employee help desk or, you know, IT uh, service desk, we could have, you know, a user trigger Lucy through Skype for business and have, you know, just like you would chat with one of your peers or colleagues, you know, chat with Lucy and get the resolution done. So that was the, you know, um, communication between Lucy and the dealer that we saw. What we are going to see now is Lucy now taking those details, going back to the you know, order management system, placing the order, you know, um, all automated, right? So um, that will close the chain for us. Lucy
Lucy then triggers a request to process automation tool, which accesses information from different systems to place the order with the information Lucy has collected. It will execute the action by preparing and posting an order to the supplier. The order reference number is shared with Lucy, which is then provided to the user along with the purchase summary. Thanks for your booking. Here is your reference number, 756-789. Our representative will contact you soon for payments and further details. This example demonstrates a powerful synergy where Lucy improves the link between the humans and the RPA platform. So essentially what we have done here is, you know, um, except for rare, you know, um, level 2, level 3 application, you know, um, code level issues, pretty much all technical issues get fixed by, you know, um, uh, Lucy. A lot of it actually, honestly, is, you know, identity and access management, you know, um, needing to, you know, reset a password or, you know, um, so all those happen, you know, without any, interf uh, you know, interference, right? It's all zero touch. Um, the order gets placed while the customer is st still sitting with the dealer. The um, customer doesn't have to come back another day to, you know, really see what options are available, right, while the application issues are getting fixed. And uh, net net, and that, you know, giving us close to 95 percent, you know, automated throughput. We have implemented this, you know, um, for the North America division and we are going to be, you know, taking it to France and Germany. So that will be, you know, um, from a language perspective, uh, uh, you know, our uh, uh, first markets that we will take to, you know, France and Germany, and then we'll roll it out to the rest of the 37 countries. But the larger message is, you know, um, we, our, our focus really is to go beyond RPA, bring in front office, middle office, back office automations in one value chain so that we can, one, improve the user experience, and most importantly, you know, maximize the business case impact. So that's that's pretty much what I had to present and I can take any question if there is. Um, which industries are you focused on as a priority in terms of front office, middle office, back office and if you were to categorize your leading practice um, success use cases that would be helpful? Um, in terms of the solution itself, it's pretty modular. We have not, you know, restricted it to any specific domain or a particular technology or a platform consciously so that we could quickly adapt it. But in terms of where we are seeing maximum traction, you know, um, it is, I would say, telecom, banking and financial services, obviously, you know, um, and manufacturing as well. So, you know, manufacturing and, uh, you know, um, for Lucy integrated one, you know, specifically we are seeing consumer, you know, also, you know, uh, so today if you go to, you know, um, Escho, uh, Ludar, you know, um, they actually wanted physical bots, you know, um, in their showrooms to help customers choose the right cosmetic, you know, um, based on whatever their preferences. So, you know, um, we have worked with a partner to put a physical bot, you know, a physical bot with dry ice, you know, um, engine running it. Um, so, you know, it is modular, we can pretty much plug it, plug it into any industry, any use case, but where we are working today, you know, is banking, you know, um, uh, manufacturing and um, uh, telecom. Sure. Hey, that was great. Thanks, Shagan. Um, I'm learning a lot continuously. Um, I think I heard earlier that um, whereas RPA, you can buy a generic platform and you put your rules in and do it yourself. With AI, it's very much solution specific. Um, and yet here you seem to be offering up a generic platform that includes AI. How, how do you reconcile those two things? Um, you know, when you get deep into things like, let's say, computer vision, where you have to probably, you know, look at something very, very industry specific or a product specific um, a scenario, yes, it needs to be customized. But our, you know, um, core platform, and there, there, there might still be some customization needed, you know, tuning up of the algorithms needed, you know, um, for each implementation. So it's, I mean, when I say plug and play, you know, it's not, you know, 100% um, ready out of the box, right? So, but we have tried to keep those customizations as minimal as possible. And we leverage a lot of what's available in the market, right? I mean, the likes of TensorFlow and 
um, Wolfram Alpha. You know, there's a lot available in the market. There's a lot of new algorithms being developed. There's a lot of use cases being covered by you know, um, uh, you know, um, um, industry players today. And we don't want to you know be the shop that creates you know and churns out algorithms day in and day out, right? Whatever is available in the market, we use it. And all these that are available are open source. You know, pretty much you know um, a simple you know. Um, um, one hour, you know, uh, integration is all it takes, right? So that's why we say, you know, I mean, it's plug and play, uh, you know, we can quickly adapt it, um, but it will still need some level of customization and tuning. And obviously, you know, the training of the ML engine or the AI engine is going to be very specific to each use case and that will take its time, right? But in terms of the pure technology part of it itself, we have made it modular, you know, and plug and play, but there will obviously be customization, tuning and uh, training that will be very specific to each implementation. Hi, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, question. Do, are you aware of any study being done by what type of customers will adapt to this type of technology so far? Anywhere there is an interface or you know, communication and collaboration I, I, involved. I, I'm um, sorry, maybe I was not clear. The customer I mean is like the people that are using, right? So on the, uh, like I'm a customer, I have a policy, I'm calling insurance company like that type of customer, not internal customers. Yes, and, and like I said, I mean, it could be any industry, wherever you have a need to call up or, you know, chat with or email someone, it will get, you know, um, um, uh, there will be a lot of AI, you know, leverage to do that, right? It could be any industry, as long as you pick up the phone or, you know, write an email or walk into a branch and, you know, to get something done, there will be, you know, um, adoption of, uh, you know, um, um, AI and, you know, um, uh, virtual technologies, right? So it, 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 it's across industries. Um, um, obviously, the big ones are the first few to adapt are, you know, the likes of banking and financial services. Like I said, telecom mm -hmm. is a big one. Um, aviation, you know, industry as, as such has been another, you know, uh, pioneer there. Yeah, I'm more interested in more like age, like, uh, uh, of your customers, like, you know, would that be acceptable for people like over 50 years old, you know, within 40 to 30, do you have that kind of study or not yet? I think um, it will be across all ages, obviously, you know, I mean, if there is a um, niche product or, a, you know, um, technology, you know, we will have to, for instance, you know, um, cosmetics that I spoke about, you know, for uh, SJ Loader, uh, you know, there is a lot of, you know, I mean, um, uh, customer profile specifically uh, in the Asia market for, uh, you know, Asia Pacific region for them who may not really be ready for, you know, um, a totally virtual, you know, um, um, assistant. And that's where we put a physical bot, right? And there are a lot of banks today adapting, you know, um, virtual assistants, but in a, still in a physical environment, right? You walk into a room, you know, um, with cameras and, you know, display available. You still sit and talk like you talk to a, you know, um, a physical person. It's just that it's virtual. So the adaption may be, you know, uh, uh, you know, phased out to make it easier for some parts of consumers to, you know, um, take it and assimilate it. But, you know, um, um, it, it will still be virtual and, you know, um, the way it is delivered may st be, you know, slightly customized. But, and gradually, you know, it will go all, uh, you know, virtual, right? Th th thanks for the presentation I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat naive to this field, so pardon my rather dummy question, but in the demo you just showed us, what was AI? I, I almost felt that everything was rules-based and the chatbot or it, um, um, whoever could could be uh, customized to catch on certain terms and offer options and then process an order what's what's ai in there the ai here is more of uh, you know natural language processing and you know the context mapping you know it's more nlp you know than ai in this use case but the other parlance of this in terms of the actual bug fixing you know or the code you know level changes which is the other part of what we do here there there is a lot of you know ai and you know um, machine learning deep learning involved where you know you really look at you know what is the you know um, um, code you know where do you need to go and fix you know highlight uh, you know identify the bug you know fix it um, in in an identity and access management where someone, you know, the, it could be the same, you know, dealer reaching out just to get his password reset where we don't use any AI, 
we just look at what's the profile, is he the right you know, um, customer, is he the authenticated one to get it reset, and we do that. There's no AI you know, involved, there's more uh, NLP. And here it is more of NLP in this scenario, but when we expand it to you know, multiple uh, um, 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 products and ranges beyond um, um, uh, you know, just the trucks part of it, right? That's where, you know, the real options to customize, you know, the ability to make, you know, judgmental decision making on what works really for this customer or not will come in. It's more of NLP here than AI. Um, the AI part of it is really in the code fixing that, uh, you know, is also automated. When you look at uh, the areas of finance, are you using some sort of biometric validation? Uh, voice recognition, facial recognition. I mean, how does a customer walking in, how do you know who you're dealing with? I mean, you look, you know, that's a huge challenge from the regulators. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are not, um, we, have, we have not leveraged biometric or, you know, facial recognition uh, in any of our implementations as it. And we have just not had the, you know, use case come up for that. But um, the technologies are there, and I know integration is quite, you know, um, um, uh, quick as well if we need to. But purely from our experience perspective, we have not had that uh, you know, opportunity yet. I guess adding on to John's question about biometrics, from a deployment perspective, have you had challenges at other, in other countries implementing the technologies? Because you know, the world is flat, but not when it comes to customer data. Um, Yes, obviously, um, I think like we discussed in the earlier sessions as well, we have had challenges, but nothing I would say that has been different from one country to the other versus what uh, we have had in a you know, pure play RPA implementation, right? It's more around governance to data security to you know, um, the, um, um, the only incremental component will be the you know, um, comprehensiveness of the training data that we get here. Because I mean, um, the the ML engine or you know the um, AI engine uh, is only as smart as you know uh, what we train it to be, right? I mean, so um, there we have had some challenges in you know some specific parts of businesses, but um, uh, you know uh, we have not ha seen anything different from you know what otherwise would be for a typical RPA implementation. Any further questions? Looks like not. So thank you, everyone. Again, I'm available, and uh, you can reach out to me. Thank you very much, Jake. Appreciate it. So I, th I think we can see that automation is going to evolve in a kind of a typical technology stack manner like we have seen with many other technologies. Uh, these sequenced or synchronized um, technologies can now be woven together, as we've seen this morning with homes, and now we've seen with dry ice, and they're joining the considerable integrated tool set alternatives. And, of course, we got the chance to meet Lucy. And her good friend and classmate, Amelia, will be joining us a little bit later. Uh, with that, we're going to take a 30-minute break, so if you could be back in your seats at 4.15, that would be spectacular. Thank you very much. <laughs>